table and turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel 24. We will read verses 1 through 7. 1 Samuel 24, beginning, beginning at, at verse 1 through verse 7. This is God's inspired and inerrant word. Now it came about when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the shepherd sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave. Now Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I am about to give you your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Then David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. And it came about afterward that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, Far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. And David tore apart his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose, left the cave, and went on his way. The reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. Let's pray together. <clears throat> acknowledge this passage of Holy Scripture as your truth. Sanctify us in your truth by the work of your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 David's journey to the throne of Israel was a long and difficult one. After all, God had rejected Saul. Samuel had said to him that God has torn the kingdom away from you. And David is God's anointed king in waiting. We know that God was sovereign over all the events of David's life. And we may wonder why the God who arranged, who had just arranged for David to escape from Saul through this wonderful, wonderfully timed providence, why it is that God couldn't immediately transfer the kingdom into David's hand. This is an aspect of a much broader question that thoughtful people sometimes ponder. If God's ultimate purpose is to bring us into a new heaven and a new, a new earth where there is no sin and there is no pain and there are no tears, why is it that we must endure the long journey of this life why so many struggles with sin? Why so much pain? Why so many tears on the way to heaven? An important insight into these questions came on the day described for us here in 1 Samuel 24. It was a day upon which David could have very easily made his path to the throne quick and easy. 
could understand why he didn't. Why he restrained himself. We'll learn something very important about why God brings the kingdom the way he does. Instead of the way that we would sometimes like him. For a long time now, Saul's pursuit of David has been intensified. It all began way back in chapter 18, when David finds himself the target of Saul's spear, and David escaped. Things begin to escalate uh, even further. Saul, uh, there was another spear incident. Saul always seemed to have a spear close by. Tend, tended to chuck it at, at David. And then there was that, uh, a, after David escaped, uh, Saul sent his henchmen to David's house to kill him. David fled to Ramah, to Samuel. Saul sent his henchmen to Ramah. Uh, they failed. Saul himself went to Ramah. He failed. And from that point, David was a fugitive on the run from King Saul. And that's where we still, in chapter 24, meet up with David here in the narrative. Chapters 24, 25, and 26 all hang together. They recount different circumstances, but they share a common theme. David's restraint in waiting for God's promise. He didn't seize God's promised kingship, but he waited for it to be given to him. And what we're being taught here is that God's servants must submit themselves to God's will in God's way and in God's time. God's servants must submit themselves to God's will in God's way and in God's time. We'll discover this by means of two points that are descriptive of Saul's and David's circumstances in our text. In the first place, Saul's power and vulnerability. And secondly, David's vulnerability and restraint. So Saul's power and vulnerability. Children, vulnerability means simply uh, weakness or defenselessness. So we're looking at Saul's power and his weakness and defenselessness and David's vulnerability and his restraint. Let's consider in the first place Saul's great power and vulnerability. The chapter opens by reminding us of Saul's military power. We read that it came about when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines. Now you remember that it was that report of the Philistines, a messenger who came to David. David uh, is on one side of the mountain uh, in the wilderness of Maon. Saul is on the other side. Saul has apparently divided forces. He's putting the squeeze move on David. David, it seems, is, is within uh, a hair's breadth of, of Saul's capture. And then in God's providence the messenger came and said the Philistines have invaded the land and Saul goes off to fight against the Philistines. David is spared. That was God's way, wasn't it? Of delivering David. But apparently Saul was successful. We can, we can infer that from what the text tells us. That Saul was successful in his engagement against the Philistines, and, and now he's, he's returning from that uh, engagement. So he had the power that was necessary to deal with him. He also had agents everywhere. Saul had a vast network of informants. And it seems like they were around every corner in the land of Judea. And they were always ready to divulge to Saul David's location. After his narrow escape from Saul in the wilderness of Maon on that mountainside, David and his men had gone into the wilderness of En Gedi. Uh, 
uh, which was a region of craggy cliffs uh, with uh, caverns and uh, sheepfolds overlooking the Dead Sea. The rocky terrain there, along with fresh water, made it a perfect place for recovery and for, uh, for hiding out as well. But due to Saul's vast intelligent, uh, intelligence network, he didn't escape, uh, David didn't escape Saul's notice for long because Saul was told that David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. And he went to seek him there in a place, where we have all these names, uh, we heard of the Rock of Escape in chapter 23 and now uh, we hear of the rock, uh, rocks of the wild goats here in chapter 24 and verse 2. And that's where uh, Saul comes to, to seek David with 3,000 men. David had only about 600 men at that time. We've been told that already by the narrator. So not only did Saul have a 5 to 1 advantage over him, but Saul had the special forces of Israel. He had chosen men from all Israel. David's army, on the other hand, was a group of oppressed malcontents who nobody would have chosen to be in their army. So Saul has a commanding power over David. But at the same time, we learn in our text that Saul is vulnerable. He's in a vulnerable position. As he came to the sheepfolds in front of the caves, there in Getty, the king needed a restroom break. The text literally reads, he went in to cover his feet. And scholars agree that that's, uh, that's a reference to the, the, the need to take care of necessities. And this royal restroom break is of interest because as it so happened, the very cave that King Saul chose to take that restroom break was the very cave in which David and his men were hiding in the inner recesses. Of all the caves in the En Gedi region, and I understand there are a lot of caves in En Gedi, Saul chose this one. And there he goes in alone and vulnerable. It reminds us of a much more powerful being who is nevertheless also vulnerable named Satan. And this isn't the first time that we've drawn a parallel between Saul and Satan as we've studied in 1 Samuel. Satan is a powerful evil spirit. He has myriads of powerful demons under his command. And yet, everything we read about him in the Bible tells us that he's on a short leash. It tells us that he's subject to divine restraint. It tells us that he's limited to the power that God is willing to give to him. And all that we understand about the Bible from Genesis to Revelation confirms this. It's important that we know this. It's important that we know that Satan's a powerful being, so that we'll be aware... That he's a wily creature and will be, uh, that will we'll know that he has, uh, that, that he, he, his plans are against God's saints. That we be aware of his ploys, but it's equally important that we understand that he's vulnerable. So that we're comforted by the knowledge that God constrains him, that he's on a short leash. The same is true of any earthly enemy, isn't it? We may have powerful enemies, but they're all vulnerable because they're all under God's restraining hand. And they can do nothing except what God has in His will for them. So that's the first thing that we all want to understand from our text. Saul's power and his vulnerability. But the second thing is David's vulnerability and 
his restraint. Now, of course, David and his men were also vulnerable as they cowered in those inner recesses in the cave. There was likely one way in and one way out of that cave. There was no path of escape for David and his men. If Saul didn't emerge from his royal restroom break in a reasonable amount of time, his men would have come in to check on him. If David and his men would, make, would have made a move on Saul in the cave, and Saul had sounded the alarm outside, were waiting 300 special forces of the Israeli army, Israeli army against 600 men. So David and his men would have certainly been outmatched. It's a time of tense uncertainty for David. Picture the scene. The army outside the cave, armed and dangerous. David and his men deep in the recesses of the cave, hidden and no doubt more than a little nervous about the circumstances. But there was another sense in which David was vulnerable, even within the ranks of his own men. David was the lone voice opposed to killing Saul on the spot. While Saul was occupied, David and his men carried on a spirited debate about what God would have David to do. And they had different ideas about that. His men perceived that God was laying a golden opportunity in his lap. Behold, this is the day which the Lord has said to you. I'm about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to it as seems good to you. We don't know whether they were quoting a previous uh, revelation about which they had some knowledge, or simply interpreting the present circumstances. It really doesn't matter. They understood this as a stroke of God's providence. They believed that David should take advantage of the circumstance and kill Saul on the spot immediately. David's, David's action followed in verse 4. He cut off the edge of Saul's robe. Now the narrator doesn't comment on the action, but it appears that David was staking his claim to the kingdom by removing that piece of Saul's robe. He maybe even viewed it as a symbolic declaration of revolt, which seems to account best for, for David's conscience, expressed in verse 5. It came about after, after that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. David thought that he had gone too far even in this symbolic action. And he says as much in verse 6, Far be it from me, because of the Lord, that I should do this thing to my Lord, to my Master, the Lord's anointing, to stretch out my hand against him, since he is the Lord's anointed. The Lord's anointed, the king, was sacrosanct. God had chosen him. God had anointed him by the very same hand by which David had been anointed, even Samuel's hand. And so he was set apart, he was consecrated to God, and he must not be violated because to attack the Lord's anointed was to attack the Lord himself because uh, it was the Lord who had anointed him and it was to remove the Lord from his rightful place. But try telling that to David's 600 oppressed and malcontented men. Apparently, he had to get quite forceful with them. Not that we would ever know that from most of our English translations, which imply that David persuaded or restrained or rebuked his men. But the Hebrew text reads that David tore apart his men with these words, suggesting that he had to resort to violent and threatening language just to cool their jets. Meanwhile, Saul got up, left 
oblivious to the fact that the one whose life he was seeking had just spared his life. You can imagine the thoughts that flowed through David's mind on that day. There was Saul in a vulnerable position within his reach. Imagine the questions that filtered through his thought process. Was God giving his enemy into his hand? Was this providence? Or was it temptation? This was a searching test for the Lord's servant. And only the principle of the sanctity of the Lord's anointed answered the dilemma for David. Here's how we might express the principle that David wrestled with in this circumstance. It was one thing to have the promise of the kingdom as the anointed king elect. It was another thing how the kingdom should come to him. In other words, David understood that the kingdom, which would certainly be his one day, wasn't for him to take his own way. The Lord's will must come about in the Lord's way and in the Lord's time. The end that God has ordained must be reached by the means that God approved. David's men couldn't see that. But it was obvious to David. And that's why in his vulnerability before his men, he exercised restraint. David's greater son faced the same test in the wilderness of Judea. The devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you. What the devil offered to Jesus, God had already promised him. Ask of me, the psalmist says in Psalm 2, verse 8, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as your possession. But Jesus understood the kingdom, which would certainly be his one day. It wasn't for him to take his own way. So he, he sent the devil packing, saying, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. God's will must come to pass in his way and in his timing, not by means of the, the shortcuts that we sometimes think about, not by means of, of the shortcut that the devil was offering to Jesus. The devil full understood, he well understood, that that shortcut would short-circuit God's plan of redemption. And so did our Savior. Christ's exaltation to the throne of glory must come through his humiliation, even though it meant more suffering on the way to Golgotha, where he would suffer infinitely on the cross. Calvary. The principle that we've considered God's will, God's way, God's time helps us to answer the question with which we began, which we said that thoughtful people sometimes ponder. If it's God's will to bring us into the new heavens and the new earth, why doesn't God just immediately translate us into the kingdom of his glory so that we don't have to endure all of the hardships, all of the sin, all of the pain, all of the tears? God's will must come in his way and in his time. And since this kind of test isn't confined to David, or to Jesus, it helps us in our course of action. When we're tempted to take the shortcuts, or when we're tempted to wish that there was a shortcut. I mentioned to you last Lord's Day evening, a woman who 
called me. Her husband asked, asked her to call me. He was beside himself as to how he might help her. They've been through immense trials in these past years. She called me again this week. And I was again able to comfort her by the very, in God's providence, uh, by the very, uh, the very text that we're, uh, that we're dealing with tonight. That God tests us. He takes us through this test. He doesn't, he doesn't always take us the easy way, does he? Our lives are filled with trials. They're filled with testing. That's what God does with, the, with his servants. And we have to recognize that it's our, Father, it's, it's our Father's good pleasure to take us the long way on the route to our eternal abode in heaven. If he has ordained that we should, that we should endure trial after trial, after trial, it's him you see. He's scraping the drops off of us. He's the one who by doing so, by putting us through the fire of our trials, is making us to shine like gold. He's working his glorious will in us. And that's, that's what we must submit ourselves to. Too, as the Lord deals with us in this life and our circumstances. Easier said than done. Isn't it? And that's why I think we so desperately need spiritual discernment. I think that's why Paul offered this prayer for the church at Philippi and why the Holy Spirit recorded it for us so that we would know to pray in the same way. And this I pray, he said, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and discernment, and that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be pure and blameless in the day of Jesus Christ. That's what he's preparing us for. In all that we experience, in our sojourn, through this world, on our way to heaven. All. It must be, we must see that, that it must be God's will in His way, in His time, in all of our circumstances. Let's pray. Our Father, we humble ourselves before Your will, we submit to that will. You know us, you know how we struggle against your will. You know how we struggle under the trials that we face in our circumstances. And you know how desperate, desperately we need spiritual discernment. And so we pray that your love may abound still more and more. In all knowledge, all knowledge and discernment, that we may approve the things that are excellent, and that you, O oh Lord, through the trials that you have brought, would make us to be pure and blameless until the day of the glorious coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.